Hey gang, hello to you. My name's Dave Keeler with the City of Virginia Beach Department of EMS, and I'd like to chat with you a little bit about the AutoVan 3000. The AutoVet 3000, there's nothing new. This has been around for many years, and we've actually had it available for deployment to marine medics, and it is not the end-all be-all of definitive care. It's not the end-all be-all of airway management, but it is an important and valuable tool that you can put in that proverbial toolbox that the providers who need definitive airway care can consider. But some of the things to consider, is they are located on the EMS-1 and EMS-2 trucks. So you've got to factor how much time is it going to take for that device to show up on scene, how far is it to the hospital or to a place that can do definitive airway care, and do you have enough people in the back of the ambulance to allow you to provide ventilatory support to the patient or do you need this device to fill in the spot because you simply don't have enough humans on scene? A few thoughts about this. The AutoVent is simple. It's simple to put together. It's simple to operate. It does meet all AHA standards. And it can be used either in routine transports from a nursing home or facility to the hospital or in an emergency setting. It's time cycled, not pressure cycled. It's gas powered in meaning that oxygen is the thing that derives it. You don't need to plug it in. You don't need battery power. And as I mentioned, you're going to find this on the supervisor trucks for EMS-1 and EMS-2. It is compact, it's ruggedized, it's durable, and easy to use. It can be used in various uh, low-light environments or temperature extremes. In fact, the manufacturer says it can operate in the temperatures of 0 to 125 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm here to tell you I don't operate in temperatures of 0 to 125 degrees Fahrenheit, but this device will. It's impact resistant. It's got some rubberized coating to absorb some bumps and shocks. And when can we use it? It's going to be indica indicated in, in all the usual scenarios that you would su suspect that it would be needed to be used. It can be used in near drowning events and traumatic events. It can be used if the patient's been intubated. It can be used if the patient's got a king airway inserted. And it can even be used in the cases of a BLS airway with an oral adjunct, for example, and just simply using the BVA mask. This will fit to and attach and can be used. The manufacturer does say that it can be used in cardiac arrest. However, in the Thames region and in particular in Virginia Beach, it's not indicated. We don't put the patient on the auto vent during the cardiac arrest, but if you get ROSC, you can put the auto vent on at that time to either breathe for or assist the patient with respirations. Now, as I mentioned, this can be used in the case of a chronically ventilated patient. And this is probably going to be the classic time that this could be deployed whether it's coming from some sort of long-term care facility, could be coming from the patient's home. Everyone's first due will have individuals, and many of you already know those individuals that live in your first due area, area that are chronically on some sort of ventilatory support. It can be used for the outpatient setting or in a hospital transfer setting. And don't forget that 
the reason you're transporting this patient may have nothing to do with the fact that they're on a ventilator. It could be for a completely unrelated medical emergency. Therefore, it may not show up in CAD. You may get on scene and, and notice that the patient's on a vent, and then your mind's going to start thinking of what's the best way we can get this patient to where they need to go. With chronically ventilated patients, especially with today's technology, dollars to donuts, they are going to have a caregiver or and they're going to have some sort of spare. They're going to have a spare ventilator. If they've called you because of their primary failure, see if they've got a spare or a portable ventilator. But it could very well be that the reason they're calling you is all of their primary ventilatory functions have failed and you're there as sort of the plan C of this operation. But whenever possible, if ever given your choice, use the patient's system or use the patient's backup system and transport the patient with their gear. The only time we're going to use the out of N3000 is in very rare and very particular cases where that's simply not an option. The most probable scenario and why we would do this is that the patient is going to have some sort of emergency ventilation. This patient's not normally on a respirator, has no need to be on a respirator, but something bad has happened right here and right now that you're going to have to put them on a ventilator. And you've determined that for whatever reason, because you do not have enough humans to assist because of the nature of the injuries or because of the transport involved, you're going to need to put this patient on the Autovent 3000. This can bring a lot of things to the table. It is going to provide perfect, consistent, repeatable values to the patient. It will consistently ventilate the patient at a setting of your choice. It has the option of incorporating a positive end expiratory pressure function, a PEEP setting. It's a self-contained package, doesn't need any other external power supply, and it can remove distractions often encountered by humans ventilating a patient. Traditionally, what is it we do during a, a, a situation that requires ventilation? We have the most inexperienced person to more or less get them out of the way at the head, ventilating the patient. And it's well established now that we are horrible at using a bag valve mask expertly and doing it properly, especially under high stress situations. If we can remove the human and let the machines take over, we can find that it can relieve us of that task while we pay attention to the other situations that the patient's encountering. And we can sort of put the ventilation worries on a back burner because it's going to provide reproducible, perfect ventilations at a perfect setting over and over again. We can get rid of that human inconsistency. But the very thing that brings its best advantage of sort of automating ventilatory support is also its disadvantage. Is it a feature or is it a bug? Once you put them on the Autovent 3000, you're going to lose the ability to get that direct tactile feedback of the ventilatory process. I often ask over and over if I have someone else bagging a patient, how's that compliance? How much effort are you putting in? Are you getting good airway passage? Are you getting good rise? And yes, I'm going to look at a monitor. Yes, I'm going to use those other senses. But you can imagine that that tactile hands-on experience is one of the ways we can ensure we're delivering good ventilatory support for the patient. And like all machines, it could be prone to mechanical failures. Not a lot of moving parts, but it is possible that you could have a failure within the device itself. 
This can handle a wide range of weights and sizes, and I want to say uh, between 11 pounds up to 325 pounds, something in that range. And it can handle patients of all those degrees. But we can conceive of a very good possibility we're going to have a patient falling outside of that range, in which case, there's your problem. Speaking of problems, if we have patients that are chronically being ventilated, they're going to have very precise settings on their devices. And one of those settings is what percentage of the air they're getting in is pure oxygen. This device delivers 100% oxygen. There is no way to adjust the inspired oxygenation settings on this patient. So for some patients that are on a very particular setting, this device could be harmful by all of a sudden dialing them up to 100% oxygenation. And like any patient that's getting positive pressure being put into them, like any patient, this can bring about a case of hypotension as we are increasing the load of the heart. There is some assembly required. Getting this from the back of the supervisor's truck onto the patient will involve some connections. The first thing to note is the hose. It's a 50 PSI hose. And this hose is designed to fit directly to the primary control unit. This hose will also be connected to what's sometimes called an Ohio Quick Connect valve. And this valve will plug directly into the wall of your ambulance. So, unfortunately, the, the Christmas tree that you would find on the side of your ambulance or the regulator that's on your oxygen cylinder, that only goes, as you can see on the dial, only goes to 25 PSI. This device requires double that, 50 PSI. So, you're going to have to have, as part of this kit, is the particular regulator that goes along with this and put that on an oxygen cylinder. Otherwise, that won't be an option. You're going to have to attach it directly into the wall of the ambulance in order to get the volumes of oxygen that you're going to need. The control module itself. Let's talk about this. This is right in the middle of it all. The primary unit that is going to contain all the regulatory mechanisms to make sure that oxygen gets where it needs to go. The first thing to talk about is your breaths per minute. This is, like I said, a time cycled device. So this is going to allow us to note how many breaths do we want to get into our patient. It can go as few as eight breaths per minute and can deliver as many as 20 breaths per minute. This also has a zero function, and that is to say if the patient is doing some spontaneous breathing, this can be set to not override the patient's spontaneous breaths, but instead work with them to allow their spontaneous respirations to sort of trigger the oxygenation event. But either way, TEMS wants you to set this device between 10 and 12 breaths per minute, which is what the typical adult breath rate is going to be. The middle button is maybe the most important button because that is going to tell you, are we ventilating a child or are we ventilating an adult? Now, what this is really doing is telling us how long is this device going to pump or inject air into the patient. And that's how it figures all the math after that. So, for a child, on average, it's going to have a 0.75 second inspiratory time where it's delivering oxygen under pressure to the patient. And for adults, it's going to have a little bit longer because it's got to deliver a little bit more oxygen. So it's going to be about one and a half seconds. 
but you can see the color coding here. The numbers in white refer to adult numbers and volumes. The orange with the circle around it is going to give you the numbers and volumes pertinent to a child. So don't get the two mixed up. The last setting is your title volume setting. This can go as little as 200 milliliters of air being delivered and as much as 1200 milliliters of air, or I should say oxygen, being delivered to the patient. The manufacturer setting, as well as the TEM setting, and discussion with our CQI officer is to deliver 10 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram to the patient. So you can figure if a patient is weighing 70 kilograms, let's say, you're going to be delivering 700 milliliters on that setting, looking on the dial, and go from there. There's some tubing that goes from the unit into another device. And that other device is the patient valve assembly. And this is sort of the actual, we'll call it a, a regulator or delivery device that is going to give us some feedback on getting the oxygen into the patient. The patient valve assembly, first of all, we'll have, you'll notice almost first off, a, a little lime green dot or cone at the very top of this device. Now this device can work sideways or not, but if you're looking at it straight up and straight down, you'll find while air, or I should say oxygen, being delivered into the patient, while the oxygen's being administrated, so during this patient's inspiratory phase, you'll see that green up into the ball. It'll be, you know, showing or, or, or displaying green. During the expiratory phase, where the machine is not pumping oxygen into the patient, you'll find this is clear. This gives you some indication visually on the back of that bumping ambulance how long and to what stage oxygen is being delivered into the patient. It's important to note, though, this has no correlation whatsoever to any spontaneous breaths the patient might give. This patient valve assembly also has sort of a built-in alarm. And it's sort of a whoopy, cushiony, squeaky kind of a reedy device. It's a mechanical orifice that will alert you if too much pressure is being administered to the patient. Think of it as a dump valve or a relief valve that prevents you from over-inflating the patient, but also alerts you that there's just simply too much pressurized oxygen being delivered to the patient. There's also an exhalation valve, and this is a silicone internal rubberized diaphragm that can be disconnected, but this is what's allowing the inhalation exhalation process. And by unscrewing the adapter, you can open it up and easily see or change this little diaphragm as necessary. There's also some tubing. Now, it comes in two flavors, if you will. This is the, on display here is the, the, the disposable version. It's the Bluetooth that's going to have a non rebreathing valve attached to it. This is a demonstration of what comes with the device, and it's going to be white tubing, a little bit more solidy, a little bit more plasticky, and it's also going to have a version of a non-rebreathing valve. So here's the non-rebreathing non valve right here. This is going to be the end that connects to the hose. 
And here's a port that would be available for a peep valve if it was necessary for a chronically ventilated patient. So here's sort of the total package. These are all the parts that would need to be put in front of you in order to start administering and using this device with the patient. If we're even going to start, the tank's got to have at least 50 PSI going into the device. Like I talked about, you cannot use a Christmas chew valve. It's got to be directly put into the tank, and it's got to be able to deliver, deliver that gas at 50 PSI. That's what controls the module, and that's what allows the triggering device. That pressure is what's going to open and close the valves necessary to deliver that high concentration oxygen. Also, please do not over tighten these things. Hand tightening of the hoses and connectors are going to be all that's needed. So, like any kind of advanced airway technique, we will confirm that the airway, and in this case, let's just presume the patient's going to be innovated because more often than not that's going to be the situation we're going to deploy this. We want to make sure we have the innovation, do all of our normal techniques that we do to confirm that we've innovated the patient correctly. We're going to secure that tubing and start ventilating that patient by BVM. Do not just instantly slap this device on the patient the moment you're finished securing that airway. Like anything else, put them on the ECG monitor, put them on that life pack. We're going to put them on that end tidal catamography that will work with this device. And we're going to monitor the pulse ox of that patient as well so that we can see all the value, values of this patient. We've made sure that our hoses are connected. They're all pretty much only going in one way for the uh, valve circuit and decide whether we want the disposable or whether we want the semi-permanent ventilator circuit and then last thing we do is we're going to connect it to the O2 source. Remember adult white child orange settings and just the knob based on the patient you have. Set the tidal volume, so do some math, figure out the patient's weight, convert it to kilograms, and multiply by 10. That's going to be the number we're starting with. Then we set the breaths per minute, and we're going to want to give it a go at 10 to 12 breaths per minute as our baseline value. Once we have these settings done correctly, then we can swap the BVM over to the auto vent. Remember to continue to use that inline catmography. And as you can see by the pictures, and if you experience the device in real life, this uh, valve assembly is going to be a heavy, bulky item. We want to make sure not to allow it to drag or pull or tug at the ET tube. So many tricks of the trade are to secure it to the patient's shoulder. You may secure it to the CID. Uh, and you want to be able to see that top lime green value or someone is able to monitor that. But we want to make sure that it doesn't roll or fall off the patient or get entangled in anything that in turn could dislodge the tube. With any other intervention, reassess, do that follow-up, ensure that the patient's getting good rise and fall of the chest, and give a listen to ensure that you're getting the bilateral breath sounds. Your settings are your starting settings. Monitor the results of your intervention and adjust your values as needed to make sure we get the optimal oxygenation numbers. 
We want to look out for any kind of deterioration of the patient's condition. We want to make sure that we're not going to have any kind of mechanical device failure of either the oxygen delivery auto vent 3000 or any kind of failure in our diagnostic or sensing equipment. You certainly want to make sure that the patient is not going to start to buck the tube or that spontaneous respirations are going to interfere with the ventilatory process. You don't want excess mucus or anything plugging up the tube and all the other classic signs. We don't want any kind of hypoxia. We don't want to see the patient turning blue. We do not want to see the pulse ox drop. And if the patient is generating any kind of spontaneous breath, we don't want to see any stuttered or labored breathing. And good gracious, we don't want the patient fighting us so hard once we put them on the out of it. We've done something wrong if that's the case. But we do know to watch for any kind of increased heart rate or any signs or symptoms that the patient is maybe gaining some level of ability to react or their consciousness level is allowing them to become aware of their, society, their surroundings. Some other big things to remember, treat the patient don't just treat the numbers. Don't just treat the machine. Maintain, you can take the patient's ventilation. It should be on the front burner. I don't want to diminish that. But if you are placing this patient on the auto vent because you don't have enough personnel to monitor or deal with ventilating that patient, don't lose sight of the fact that machine is there and that machine is doing its job. Make sure the machine is doing its job. If anything goes sideways, disconnect the machine and put the patient back on a BVM. Please, please, it's worth saying twice, only hand tighten the fittings. If you do the math, this device could easily drain a size D portable oxygen cylinder within an hour. And we, depending on your settings, it could be as little as uh, 40 minutes you could drain the tank out. So be conscious of your oxygen supply versus how long it's going to take you to get to a new oxygen supply. And calculate that accordingly. You have to throw in a safety margin as well. This device will not work if the tank is at less than 500 PSI in the tank itself. It's got to deliver at 50 PSI through the hose, but it has to have a reserve of more than 500 PSI in the tank, otherwise it won't run. If you see any kind of problems or experiencing the problems, don't forget your dope mnemonic. We want to watch out for any displacement, any obstructions, to see if there's a potential for a pneumothorax. Has that tube become dislodged? And is there any malfunction in any of the technology that we're deploying in the field at this time? When you're switching the patient over, Try to watch very closely that patient for about a minute or two when you've engaged the AutoVent 3000 just to make sure there's no last minute displacement or failures. And we've talked earlier about that 10, uh, uh, the, the pressurizing to um, have it at 10 milliliters per kilogram. And this device is pre configured to ensure that the high pressure alarm will sound and dump the oxygen at about 45 to 55 centimeters uh, in water, of mercury in water. So studies are showing that barotrauma will affect a human at 60 centimeters in water. This is giving you sort of that 
exit or safety or relief valve to ensure that we don't cause additional trauma to the patient and that we don't overexpand their alveoli causing greater lung trauma. But as you would imagine, when you set this up and say you have guesstimated the patient's weight wrong, so you are getting a high degree of that noise that says it's dumping that oxygen, that means that we've set the pressure too high. You want to titrate those pressure levels down so you're just barely getting that sort of little end trigger of that little end level of oxygenation. And as always, 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 look at your sensors, look at your capnography, look at your pulsography to ensure that your values are where you want them to be. But although there's a great high pressure safety and dump alarm, there is no low pressure alarm. So if you're running out of oxygen or if your pressure settings are too low, there is no auditory reminder. You're only going to see this if you notice a deterioration in the patient's vitals. So although you have a high pressure alarm, there is no low pressure alarm on this device. Got to clean it after every use. The tubing, if you've chose to use the disposable tubing, you can get rid of it as such, and your supervisor should be able to secure a new one for you. You can wipe off the patient valve assembly. You can wipe off the control module with some of the purple tops or antiseptic wipes. And of course, you're going to have to restock any filters and the tubings that you've used. But do not dunk the whole assembly into a bunch of cleaning solution and actually don't dunk the whole assembly in any water at all. What you can do is disconnect the patient valve assembly so you can remove the bottom part, remove that adapter only and you can soak the bottom part in soapy water for like 10 minutes or so but do not submerge the top part. And then, of course, pat dry, hand dry, air dry it before putting it back together. So a little bit of troubleshooting. One of the classic problems is after all this distraction of assembly and connecting and hosing and ensuring that the patient's not been dislodged or anything, did you turn the oxygen source on? Is there enough oxygen in the tank that you have enough PSI and so you have enough volume and you have enough pressure being delivered to the device to allow it to ventilate the patient accordingly? Is the breaths per minute to the right setting? Are they being ventilated too much or are they not being ventilated at all? If you're getting the high pressure alarm the whole time, that means you may need to adjust the, pressure, the, the placement of the tube because it's been dislodged and therefore nothing's being ventilated in. Or it could be that somehow the airway got obstructed. Or it could be we simply didn't do the weight correctly, so we have overcompensated for pressurizing this machine, and therefore there's too much air or oxygen being delivered to the patient. And certainly, let's not rule out the risk and danger of attention to orthotics. And if they're not getting the oxygen you need, are you set correctly for your breaths per minute? Are you set correctly for your volume? And are you set correctly for an adult or a child? And again, is there some kind of clogging or disruption to the patient's airway? If nothing else, if you're like, is this device even working? You can simply hold the valve assembly to like your hand and you should instantly hear it giving that high pressure sort of whoopee cushion kind of reedy noise instantly 
and that will let you know as it's going through its inspiration phase that it is delivering the oxygen. Your problem is something to do with the patient's ET tube or patient's airway. But before you even take time to deal with troubleshooting, always, always, always be prepared to use that BVM. Always go back to that default of going with what you have in your hand to ensure that you're oxygenating this patient. So with that, thank you very much for keeping up with this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to Albemarle County and Montgomery County for use of a lot of the information that I incorporated in the display. And certainly thank you to Virginia Beach EMS's very own CQI captain, Captain Matthew Owens. Thank you so much. Be safe and take care.